Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart, or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another historical edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. As many of you may know, Nazi Germany surrendered unconditionally to the Allies on May 7th of 1945. Now, what you may not know is that two days, a mere 48 hours before that actual surrender takes place, on May 4th and May 5th in southern Austria, deep in the Tyrolean Alps, there's a battle that takes place which is of historical interest because it involves a handful of Germans and a handful of Americans standing together inside an old fortress to defend a group of, get ready for it, French POWs. I can assure you that fact really is stranger than fiction. The battle in question takes place at Castle Itter, or Schloss Itter, as it may be known to our European listeners. As you're about to hear, the actual circumstances of this battle were very real. Lives did hang in the balance, and some very incredible things were done by some very ordinary people. Now, the aforementioned French POWs are actually members of the deposed French government that surrendered in 1940, and then later on when the Vichy regime in southern France collapsed. Those people were also packed off to a nice, quiet little holding area so that at some future point they might be exchanged as uh, political pawns. Now, at the end of the Second World War, these French politicians find themselves tucked away inside an old Austrian castle guarded by a handful of SS troops who are under the direct supervision of the Nazi bureaucracy that just happens to administer the death camps. Now, this old Austrian castle might be some swanky digs, but hey, a prisoner of war camp is still a prisoner of war camp. The fact of the matter is, they had machine guns and barbed wire around the place, and those POWs were under no illusions. If they made an effort to escape, they were going to be shot. Now, one thing led to another, and in hindsight, we can now say that the SS guards did what you would have expected them to do under those circumstances. They bugged out as Allied forces approached, which left the French POWs in something of a bind, because while they were momentarily free, they were also surrounded by roaming bands of fanatical SS troops that would be quite happy to kill them if they happened to know that there was nobody guarding them. What could have turned out to be one of history's more unfortunate bloodbaths actually morphs into one of history's most ironic rescues because a group of disaffected Germans gets together with a group of rapidly advancing Americans. They hunker down inside this old Austrian castle and there they fight an Alamo-style battle against the roaming SS units in the area that are still loyal to the Nazi regime. Now, as incredible as the circumstances of this battle are, the outcome is even more spectacular. Now, I say that for two reasons. The first is that until now, we know so little about it. And secondly is the fact that it changes forever the destiny of so many lives. Now, you don't have to take my word for any of this, because over the course of the next hour, for the remainder of this episode, I'm going to share with you a conversation that I had with noted author and military historian Stephen Harding. He's going to be telling us about his latest book. It's called The Last Battle. It chronicles the events I've just described. It's published by DeCapo Press. 
in May of 2013. I know what you're thinking. This story sounds so good that it ought to be a movie. Well, the author actually has a few comments in that regard because his book has been optioned for a movie. And during the course of this interview, he's going to tell you a little bit about how he came to get the screenplay developed based on his book. So, get comfortable, take out your favorite internet surfing device so that you can Google the names and the places that come up in the course of this conversation, and let's get ready to fight the last battle. My name is Stephen Harding. I am currently the senior editor at Military History Magazine, which is one of 11 magazines published by the Weeder History Group. We are the world's largest producer of history magazine. I was born and raised in Southern California. I spent three years in the Army uh, in the early 1970s, first as an infantryman and later as a radio and television journalist. When I got out of college, I attended the University of California at Santa Barbara, and I have BA and MA degrees from that uh, institution in history. After I graduated, I first ran a museum for the Navy on Treasure Island in the middle of San Francisco Bay, which was uh, an interesting job, especially in you know, that was in the late 1970s. I went on to become a staff historian, first for the Air Force and then in the U.S. Army History Program. I was a staff historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History, and I left there in 1985 to go to Europe to um, work in the headquarters of the U.S. Army in uh, Heidelberg, Germany. I came back from there in 1989 and became uh, at first the assistant managing editor and eventually the managing editor of Soldiers, which is, was at that time the official magazine of the U.S. Army. At the time I left, about uh, five years ago, six years ago, it was the largest four-color monthly magazine published by the federal government. And we reached over a quarter of a million people every month. I left there thinking I was going to be retired, but I had been, I've, I've always been a freelancer uh, in mainly military and aviation and nautical subjects. And I'd been freelancing for uh, a couple of the magazines in the Weeder Group. And to my surprise, um, they offered me a job. And uh, I've been here ever since. It's a great position. Um, and unlike what I had to do when I worked for the Army, I don't have to go to places where people are shooting at each other. Uh, so it's a lot safer, although the commute's not a whole lot of fun. The Last Battle is either my eighth or ninth book, depending on how you count them, because one of them was uh, published twice by two different publishers, and uh, once in the UK and once in the United States. I've written for quite a few magazines, both here and mainly in the United Kingdom, again, on aviation and maritime and military topics. I've done both history-oriented articles and technical articles. I wrote uh, earlier uh, for James Defense Weekly quite often doing articles on hardware, aircraft, ships, things like that. Uh, the Last Battle is, I think it's an excellent book, quite honestly. I, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating story. And much like my earlier book, uh, Voyage to Oblivion, it was a tremendous research project. And, and I'm one of those people you can, you know, you can get sort of lost in the research rapture. And I do. I love researching these stories. And of course, I love writing them too. But especially when you're dealing with little known uh, historical uh, actions, it's, uh, it's really enjoyable for me to, to go find the people if they're survivors still or, or the information and the documents and then weave together the best, most factual and most interesting story that I can from all of the available facts. And that's what I tried to do in this one. So how do you come off Journey to Oblivion and then get the germ of the idea that leads you to the last battle? Well, uh, actually, The Last Battle is a story that I first heard about almost 30 years ago. When I was working as a staff historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History in Washington, I worked with an excellent historian and a very nice man, Dr. Fred Beck, um, and he had heard of this incident uh, at Castle Litter um, somewhere early in his career and had started to build a, a folder uh, with the thought of ultimately writing about it himself. But he was extremely busy in those days, and he didn't think he was going to get to it, and he asked me if I had be interested in following up on it. And I said, sure, it sounds like a great story. He shared his information with me. And then I promptly left CMH to go work in Germany for five years. And 
at that same time, I had two small children and, uh, you know, life was busy, so I didn't do a whole lot on it, although I did um, look into a few sources in Germany while I lived there. I came back to the United States in 1989 uh, to work for Soldiers Magazine, still thinking I would work on the Castle Litter story, but then I ended up traveling to, you know, delightful places like Bosnia and Iraq and various other places. And so it wasn't really until, uh, until about 2004 I was in San Francisco on a story assignment, and I went to a um, dinner party, and I got talking to a very interesting guy named Bryce Zabel. It's B-R-Y-C-E-Z-A-B-E-L. And Bryce is now and has for many years been a very successful Hollywood screenwriter. And of course, I'm telling him the story, and he's, his eyes are lighting up. He says, this would make a great movie. So uh, I, I certainly agreed. That prompted me, although my not right away. It prompted me to jump back into the red, the, the uh, research on the Castle Litter story sort of wholeheartedly. And in 2008, I sold the first magazine version of the story to Weeders World War II magazine. And it got a tremendous response because it's, it's a great story. It's a very little known story, obviously. But I didn't realize at that point that some of the data that I included in the article was inaccurate. Um, and so when Bryce and I started thinking this really could make a real movie. I, I thought, you know, I need to write this book. Uh, I need to find out the whole honest, complete story. So I jumped back into it with, uh, with both feet in uh, about 2010 and uh, did a huge amount of research. German archives, Austrian archives, the uh, Polish archives for a Medinic concentration camp. I went through the National Archives uh, in College Park, Maryland, the, the modern military branch, and I was able to track down three people who'd actually participated in the event. These are the last three survivors of the uh, events at Cat uh, Castle Itter. And I did interviews with them. I was able to find people who'd known Jack Lee, the American tank captain, as a young man. I tracked down information about him, about the other American soldiers involved. It was just a really fascinating research adventure. And I know that a lot of people won't understand that, but you know, research can be just incredibly uh, fascinating. And, and you, you find all sorts of little side trails to get off on. And, and part of doing research for a book is you have to limit yourself. You have to say, okay, that's an interesting sidelight, but I'm not going down that. So I wrote the book. Uh, the actual writing took about about eight months, and my agent, uh, as soon as I was done with it, started uh, offering it around, and, and the Kapu uh, was very, very interested in it and sort of snapped it up, and that's where we are now. And I want to go back to the historical uh, accuracy issue because a lot of people are hearing about this for the very first time, and there are some important reasons for that. And I've got a background in history myself, so I understand mm -hmm. why this is. And I want to touch on this just for a moment because okay. pe people don't stop. You know, we, we are familiar with the issue of political correctness today, but we don't stop to think that there were versions of political correctness in past eras. And at the end of World War II, the idea that you would say anything good about the Germans was just too far out there and the fact that you want the, the fact that anybody could say anything good about the handful of Germans that did the good deed at this place and at this time was just it was a little bit too much and that contributes to the obscurity of of this event and I'm curious to know as you went through your research how much of that historical prejudice barrier did you actually have to pierce? That's a fascinating question. Um, and you're absolutely right in uh, your description of sort of the uh, general allied and specifically American disinterest in, you know, the idea of, of good Germans. I mean, they were dealing in the, you know, late 1940s with the war crimes trials, the revelations of the Holocaust, and all sorts of other things. So the, you know, you're absolutely right. The idea of a good German, except for those few who were, you know, executed after uh, plots against Adolf Hitler, was was just inconceivable. In in researching this, I very quickly found out early on that uh, Josef Gangl, uh, Sepp Gangl, as he's called, the Bavarian born German officer who threw in his lot with Jack Lee is a national hero in Austria and in Germany for that matter because he uh, aided the Austrian anti-Nazi resistance. He and, and 
I'll, I'll get back to Yosef Gangel later, but uh, he, he's a, a fascinating uh, human being. In researching this, you know, you have to go beyond to, to find the sort of information about Germans who who actually helped an Allied soldier. You have to go beyond some of the usual sources. Um, you always start with the with the basic official sources, and, and in this case, these were the uh, daily, weekly, and monthly narrative histories generated by the U.S. Army units involved, the the divisions, all the way down to battalion level. And these are, you know, essentially combat diary that are compiled within hours or certainly within days of any action that takes place. And while they often sort of fudge on, on the times in terms of hours and, and, and occasionally by one or two days, by comparing them and sort of weaving together the, the chronology that they produce, you you come down with the official American account of it. And it's possible to do something of the same thing in terms of the German accounts. Although by you know April and May of 1945, the, the Wehrmacht was in complete disarray. Units were surrendering, other units were fighting. There was no effective command and control really above regimental level in a lot of places. So there's not that same wealth and richness of uh, official narrative histories, but I was able to find through some diligent research on my own and by hiring a couple of very savvy uh, professional archival researchers, uh, researchers um, I was able to find the military personnel files for both Josef Gangel, the Wehrmacht officer, and uh, Kurt Schrader, the uh, SS officer. And those listed all of their assignments, their decorations, their injuries, everything else. So that's another facet of the research. And then by uh, after World War II, the United States government, primarily the Army, got a lot of former senior German officers to write their appreciations of the military activities of the German military in the last years of the war, organization, combat action, and things like that. So I was able to find these battle studies, if you if you will, for those units that were in Austria or in southern Germany at the time all this happened. You take all of this wealth of information and you weave it all together with the personal narratives that I was able to get from from the three people who were uh, still alive who'd been involved in it and from all of the official records and then as any journalist or historian does you try to weave together the most accurate concise and again interesting story from the facts that you have one of the things you alluded to earlier which is very true is as any you know reporter knows if three people witness a car wreck, you can have four different stories of what happened because people see things in different ways and they're influenced by their own thoughts or, or you know, where they were standing. That's especially true in combat because people who are getting shot at tend not to think rationally or in, in linear ways. It's a, it's a series of impressions. So you can literally have two men who are 10 feet apart in the same firefight, and they will remember it in vastly different ways, depending on their personal point of view and whether they're wounded or, or, or not. The historian's job, uh, and in, for that matter, the, you know, the, the journalist's job, if you're a, a beat reporter for a newspaper, is to make the most sense of, that you can of the information that you have and then synthesize it and, to a certain extent, apply logic and common sense to it. So if you interview 10 people, and although their accounts vary, nine of them are generally the same, but you have one guy who's completely off the other end, chances are he's not remembering that event as well as those other nine people were, although that's not always true. So in putting this together, especially because of concerned Germans, I did have to discount a certain amount of immediate post-war propaganda, you know, things like you can't believe anything a German says. You know, in the case of Josef Gangel especially, I mean, you know, he was never, as far as I was able to determine, he was never a member of the Nazi party. He was a professional soldier. He was a soldier before the Nazis came to power, and he, he remained a soldier when they did, as many Germans did. For many of them, there wasn't much of an option. So I think that really is is how I'd answer your question. It's all it's all about gathering information with the widest net possible, and then you know, sort of rationally and in a common common sense way, just synthesizing it to come up with the most accurate uh, account of the events. Probably the stickiest part of the whole thing might very well have been the processing of the memoirs of the French VIPs, because I note that you say in your notes at the end of the book that. All of them who bothered to mention the Castle Inner activities pretty much downplayed it. They did, and you know there are there are a couple of uh, reasons for this, and I think one of them is in their post-war memoirs they were all 
I think, more interested in vilifying each other for not what happened at Castle Litter and for the you know, many petty arguments they had there. And, and we can talk about why they had those uh, in a minute. But, you know, they uh, there were some very powerful personalities and many of them were just absolute political arch enemies. So in their post-war memoirs, they wanted to point out how their adversaries had kowtowed to the Germans or not been strong enough on defense or whatever it is. And I think secondly, because uh, while several of the of the French prisoners held the castle litter ended up taking an active part in the defense of the castle against the SS, I think it probably would have been embarrassing for all of them that they had to be rescued by the Americans. And oh my God, by the Germans. The last thing they wanted to see was more Germans rolling up in front of the castle, but that's exactly what happened. And if you remember in the book, uh, Edouard de Ladier was not at all impressed with Jack Lee. He, he kind of snipped that, you know, this is what the Americans are like. Europe's in for a tough time after the war. And I think there was a certain amount of that uh, sometime sort of French haughtiness, uh, especially in that period in history. Um, the French point of view of the Americans was not always a, a positive one. I think that was part of the reason. I'd like to pause for a brief commercial break, and when we come back on the other side, I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about the location where all of this takes place. We now know that this is a very remarkable battle that takes place at the end of the Second World War. We know approximately that the location is southern Austria at Schloss Itter, that's Castle Itter, just in case somebody wants to Google it. But uh, we'll we'll, uh, pick this up when we come back on the other side. This program is brought to you by ShadowFusionBooks.com. Set the stage. The the castle itself really ends up being a character in the story. I don't know if you intended it to be that way or not, but it it worked out that way, didn't it? Did you intend that? I did, actually. That's I'm, I'm glad you recognize that. It, Castle Itter, uh, to, a, to a much lesser extent, obviously, for Americans, but in, in Austria, in a lot of ways, Castle Itter is sort of looked at as not necessarily Alamo, but it, it has a certain historical resonance for us Austrians because uh, it was a fairly signal event in Austrian history right at the end of the war. The Castle Itter is, is, even today, it's a very imposing place. It's on the top of a hill that kind of overlooks the Brixenthal Valley. There's the Brixenthal River, which is which runs into the Inn River Valley. And, and that area of Austria in, in Tyrol has been sort of a historic invasion route, or at least a, a, a route of movement between Central Europe and the Italian Peninsula. For millennia, there have been armies moving back and forth up and down these valleys. And the castle, when, you, when you're driving from the little town of Virgil, which is the closest sort of town to the castle, you can see it perched up on the ridge, ridge line, and you can see how it commands the valley. I mean, the first fortifications were built there in the ninth century, so people, you know, even a thousand years ago realized the importance of it. And I wanted to be, you know, have people sort of have a, uh, an idea in their minds, uh, because we don't, you know, I mean, when you think about defending a medieval castle, you think about boiling oil and siege engines and stuff like that. You don't think about modern artillery and small arms. And so I wanted people to get an idea that even though the weapons have, had advanced over you know, the centuries, attacking a castle like, like uh, Itter is not an easy proposition. Um, even direct hits with 88 millimeter artillery shells, they gouged holes in the walls, but but not much more than that. So to be able to describe the history of the castle and why it was strategically important over time, and then that sort of led us into why the Germans wanted to use it as a as a prison for what they called Ehrenhaftlinge or honor prisoners. Uh, it was remote. It was very secure, although as Jean Barotra later pointed out, it wasn't escape proof, but it was in an area that was easily controlled by the Germans you know, tactically in terms of access. And it was it was a castle. I mean, all they needed to do was sort of beef up the, uh, the fences and the gates and the locks, and uh, it was a fairly secure place. Well, since you have mentioned the, the French prisoners, because the American and German characters are going to overshadow so many of the, the French dignitaries throughout the story for the sake of the American audience here tell everybody who these French VIPs were and what their role in history was at this point because these, these this was the who's who of anybody from the French government that you would want to hold captive in the 1940s exactly exactly um, the general background on this is 
there were 14 French honor prisoners. This is a, a term that the Germans applied to them that were held at Schlossetter after it opened uh, as a as a prison. And uh, I'll mention a few names here. There were former prime ministers, Paul Reynaud and Edouard de Lattier. There were two former generals, Maurice Gamelin and Maxime Vegan. There was a labor leader named Leon Jouhou, who was, was just like a, a, you know, a towering figure in French trade unionism, really from World War I on. There was Jean Barotra, who was a um, a uh, Basque-born French tennis player who was famous in the interwar period. I mean, this guy was was just like you know he was a rock star in, in tennis in those in those years. There was Marcel Granger, uh, who was exactly the opposite. He was essentially a nobody. He was a, a colonial, a French colonial farmer in North Africa. Really, the only reason he ended up in Schlossetter was because his brother was married to the daughter of a free French general, and the Germans were rounding up anybody who was related to him to use as, as pawns. Another prisoner was a gentleman named Michel Clemenceau, who was imprisoned because his father had been the prime minister of France during World War I, and because Michel, the son, um, was very outspoken about how he felt about the Germans and anybody who collaborated with them. Um, at the right end of the spectrum, there was Francois de la Roque, who was a highly decorated World War I veteran. In the interwar years, he... Uh, he became a leader of a ultra right wing veterans group, the Quad de Fou. And you'll know, have to pardon my French accent. French is not my <laughs> native language. And he was an extremely right wing. He was often called a fascist, and uh, in fact, you know, was was instrumental in in uh, some of the huge riots that occurred in France in the late 1930s. And then you also have another sort of non entity, uh, although he was a very nice man apparently. His name was Alfred Caillot. He was the he was in uh, Castle, Castle Itter only because his wife, Mary Agnes, was the sister of uh, Charles de Gaulle, the free French general. Again, the Germans had wanted to scoop up anybody who was related to Charles de Gaulle so they could use him as a uh, uh, bargaining chip. And there were uh, 10 men, uh, 10 male French prisoners and four women. And the women, in, in some ways, are actually the more interesting. The first was a woman, Augusta Bruchlin. She was French, uh, born in Alsace, so she grew up speaking both French and German, hence the name Brooklyn. Uh, and she was the longtime secretary and personal companion of Leon Jouhou. Um, they'd been together for 30 years. Then there was Christiane Mabir, who was just in her 20s. She was Paul Reynaud's secretary and after the war became his wife. And they actually have children who are still living in France. Uh, who are not much older than I am. The other woman, of course, was Mary Agnes Caillot, the de Gaulle's sister. And the last was General Wigan's wife, whose name was Marie Renee Josephine. Augusta Brooklyn, Christine Mabir, and uh, General Wigan's wife were, and for that matter, Augusta Brooklyn, were all in, in prison because they chose to be, because they wanted to be with their companions. Uh, or in Madame Wigan's uh, case, her husband. So they, you know, they the Germans made them sign documents saying we, the Germans, are no not responsible for your health or safety if you choose to do this, and they did it anyway. These are these are remarkable women, very strong personalities. The key thing that people should know about this is of these 14 French uh, prisoners, um, they formed three sort of cliques once they were in prison because many of them hated each other viscerally and aggressively because of politics. For example, Reynaud and Delatier had been sort of political rivals for years, and actually their uh, mistresses in the pre-war years hated each other, so that added a, a different sort of competition. The two generals, Gamelin and Wagon, hated each other because Gamelin had been the chief of staff and was essentially, after the German invasion, replaced by Wagon. So they had you know, bones to pick with each other. You had people like Francois de la Roque, who was an extreme right-winger. Well, he hated Leon Giroux, who was uh, a left-wing trade unionist, so their politics didn't go along very well. And then, for the most part, the women who were incarcerated there tended to, you know, sort of side with their people, with their men. These people, you know, they're in prison in an alpine fortress, and they wouldn't even sit together to eat dinner. They would pass each other in the hallway, muttering insults under their breath. I mean, these these, these people really did not like each other, and uh, they were just irascible, all of them. And there were a couple who could go back and forth. Jean Barot, he was in prison mainly because he had joined the Vichy government, although he did it against his own good judgment, and he ultimately resigned. But he was sort of seen as a... Uh, as a right-wing stooge by 
the, the left wing people. And uh, but at the same time, he was such a nice guy that he was able to kind of you know go back and forth between the parties. And then of course the the French detested the SS guards who ran the prison and and Sebastian Wimmer, the uh, the SS commandant. So there was a lot of ill will floating around the castle, uh, enough to go around for everybody. I find it fascinating that because of the individual journeys that they had to take before they got to that castle, that they were not able to find a common cause once they got there. I mean, some of them saw firsthand what the Germans were doing in those death camps, and yet when they get to this place, they are still unable <laughs> to bury the hatchet. Yeah, and, and I think uh, it probably would have been easier for them to bury the hatchet if they'd remained in the terrible conditions of Sachsenhausen or Dachau or, or any of the, uh, the concentration camps. But, you know, Schloss Itter, although it was a prison, these people could not leave, and they, they were told if they tried to escape, they'd be shot. Um, it was relatively posh. They ate three good meals a day, largely prepared from uh, foodstuffs gathered from the local area, so fresh dairy products and fresh bread and everything else. Plus, they were provided with wine and cigarettes and brandy and all sorts of things. There was no hard labor. Nobody was tortured. The, the conditions were very humane, especially considering it was run by the same SS units that ran the concentration camps. So had conditions been harsher, it probably would have you know, brought them uh, closer together and there might have been a little more solidarity. But with conditions that good, you know, they didn't have to band together. They, I mean, they could continue to hold these petty grudges, and and uh, and it didn't really affect them. Yeah. Before we move on, I would like you to fill in one important piece of the puzzle here, because there is one thing that some of our listeners won't understand. Uh, explain why the Germans were holding these people and treating them so well. I know why this is, but there's people out there listening to this, and they're wondering why so many resources were being devoted to such a small number of people in such desperate circumstances. The, there, there really are two basic reasons. The Germans wanted to hold important people for use as either hostages, hoping maybe that you know by threatening to kill Paul Reno they could coerce the, the French into doing something they wanted them to do, or uh, as uh, pieces to be traded if the war started going badly for the Germans, um, and let's say Himmler uh, was caught, he could say, well, look, I know where you can find Paul Renault and Edward Deladier, and if you go easy on me, I'll tell you where they are, and they'll still be alive when you get there. There was also another coercion factor. As I mentioned, the Germans were going out of their way to find all of the relatives they could of people like uh, Charles de Gaulle or Henri Giraud or any of the free French leaders, partially to be able to coerce them. You know, they then be able to get a message to Charles de Gaulle and say, look, we have your sister and your you know, nieces and nephews and, and all these other people and, and we'll execute them if you don't do A, B, or C. So there was there was that. And then, of course, Hitler, while he may have had a lot of psychological issues, wasn't stupid. You know, he knew that there was always a chance that uh, things could go badly for Germany. So I think he wanted to have a lot of very important people, political people, military people, social leaders, intellectual leaders, kept alive in relatively good condition uh, so that if the war started going badly, he could use them as, as pawns in the negotiation. And it wouldn't have done him much good to try and negotiate if these people had been kept on starvation rations in Dachau or something. So when they set up, the, the Germans set up a, a whole system of these sort of VIP prisons, to use a certain shorthand. Um, they called them again, Aaron Haftlinger, which means honor prisoners. So the, the people who ran these prisons were ordered by Hitler through Himmler uh, to take very good care of these people, keep them healthy, keep them alive, just in case they needed to be used at, at, you know, at some later date. But there was always the caveat put out that if we tell you to execute them, you do it immediately. And so the people who ran these sort of exclusive prisons, while they treated the prisoners well, were perfectly uh, willing and able to kill them on a moment's notice if they were ordered to. I don't want to give away too many details of this rescue because I really do want people to read this book. So let's zero in on the situation that precedes the rescue. What do we need to know about Sebastian Wimmer and his right-hand man, Stefan Otto? Um, 
the, the basic thing we need to know about uh, Vimmer and Otto are that they were a couple of very bad people. Sebastian Vimmer had been a beat cop in Munich in the, in the interwar period. You know, he wasn't stupid, but he was brutal and he was a thug and he liked to beat up prisoners. And when, when the Nazi party organized and, and became powerful, it uh, attracted him immediately. And he was also the perfect kind of guy from the Nazi point of view. He was strong, willing to follow orders, not necessarily an idiot, but, you know, a man with grudges, both personal and, and political. So he joined the SS. And uh, in the early part of the war, he was assigned to a unit that followed the German army into Poland after the September 1939 invasion. And his unit followed the frontline combat troops. Their sole job was to round up and in most cases execute members of the Polish intelligentsia, surrendered Polish POWs, Catholic priests, Jews, anybody who was you know, considered to be a potential difficulty for the for the Nazis once they were running Poland. After that, transferred to uh, the SS TV, which is the part of the SS that actually ran the concentration camps. And he was primarily an administrator. He ran the logistics for a couple of camps. One of them was Maginek in Poland. Part of it was just sort of mundane accounting. He would find markets for the eyeglasses that they took from the Jews and for the shoes, and he would bring in food for the, the German guards and, and that sort of thing. But he, his hands had blood on him. I mean, he, he also made decisions about who was going to live and who was going to die in these various camps. He was he was a bad customer all the way around, and he also had a tremendous drinking problem. And as we know from several accounts, anytime he had more than a couple of drinks, he got very brutal very quickly and threatened to shoot people, beat up people, even his own men. So, I mean, this this guy was a classic sort of sociopath who ended up in, in concentration camp service. Stefan Otto is, a, is um, somewhat harder to read because... I found it virtually impossible, you know, even after years of research, to come up with much more than the fact that he existed and that he was in the uh, SD, the Sicherheitsdienst, uh, the intelligence service, essentially, of, of the SS, and that uh, I know a couple of his assignments. But where he came from and where he ended up, I was never able to find out. But from the few accounts we have of his behavior, while not as brutal uh, as Vimmer was, um, he was not somebody you'd want to be really good friends with. And he also had tremendous power of life and death, not only over the French prisoners, as, just, as did Vimmer, but over the SS guard troops that initially uh, staffed Castle Litter, because an, an SD officer had a direct line to Himmler. And if he thought you weren't sufficiently uh, strong in your party beliefs, you could end up on the Russian front or, or even worse. So together, these two were just a, na a nasty duo all the way around. Now, the fact that they desert the garrison, that they pack up and leave Castle Itter as American forces approach, mm -hmm. uh, there's uh, there's there's nothing out of character about that. It's it, it's in its historical context. They, as you say, they've they've got blood on their hands. They know what this is going to look like when the authorities arrive. Mm -hmm. So they. It makes and it does make sense that they pack up and go. The one thing that I find particularly surprising, it's almost providential that 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 Wimmer's choice, the guy that he reaches out to, is uh, Kurt Schrader. I mean, how does he end up picking such a decent human being? Um, well, first of all. Uh... <laughs> Not to put too fine a point upon it, we're not sure how decent a human being Kurt Schrader was earlier in his military career. Um, I'm not he, trying he, to be glib, but he no, didn't, no, no. He, he didn't uh, just go out there and shoot these guys in the castle courtyard. He stuck, he, he stuck it out when he it really wasn't exactly good for him to do it. Exactly. I think in answer to the original question, I think the reason Vimmer uh, tapped Schrader for this, just basically two reasons. He knew Schrader. He had known Schrader in Poland and their their paths had crossed. Uh, bear in mind, you know, Vimmer's SS and Schrader is Waffen SS. And so while, as you know, the Waffen SS was the combat arm, it was not unheard of for Waffen SS officers and straight S, uh, regular SS officers to cross paths. So they, they'd known each other, um, were pretty well acquainted, if not really good friends. But secondly, it's mainly just because Schrader was there. He was in the village of Itter recuperating from some fairly serious wounds. And um, Vimmer just reached out to him because, uh, you know, he himself wanted to be gone. 
and and yet I think his concept of of discipline and order didn't allow him to just bug out without you know officially signing things over, and that may have just been to to cover himself in, in case he was snagged by the SS. He would he wouldn't have to say, well, I deserted my post. He could say, I transferred you know command of Schlossitter to this Waffen SS officer. Schrader's an interesting character because he was, as far as we can tell, for most of his life up until he ended up at Castle Litter, he was a dyed in the wool. Nazi. I mean, he, you know, his father was was an early supporter of the Nazis. Schrader himself was in the youth movement early on. He went to the master's degree program in, in Nazism uh, as a younger man, and then he was in the Waffen SS. He fought on the Eastern Front. He was wounded repeatedly. But I think by the time you know he got to Castle Litter, he was worried about his wife and his children. Uh, he'd had to move them because they'd been bombed out of several cities. And and I think like a lot of people at that point in Germany, no matter what their politics. Had been early on, they had watched their country be bombed into, you know, essentially smoking rubble, and they were aware of what had caused that. And I think he, like a lot of other people, was was completely aware of the futility of continuing the fight. And so I think he, you know, pitched up in in the village of Itter with the intention of just laying low until the war ended. And when Vimmer came to him, I think he might have made a calculation that, well, you know, helping to prevent the deaths of all these important French VIPs might gain me some goodwill with the Allies when they show up, as they, as he knew for a fact they would. I mean, you know, he was privy when he was on the staff of, of the um, local uh, unit in Virgil. He'd seen the intelligence reports. He knew the Americans were going to show up any time, and they were going to come, you know, with guns blazing. So I think he might have also made the calculation that not only was, would he be able to protect his wife and children, he would be able to gain for himself some some traction when it came to uh, dealing with the Allies. I'd like to take a moment to pause for the last commercial break in this program, and when we come back on the other side, I'd like to shift gears and talk about some of the historical figures in this real-world drama that interested me the most. I'm Luke Herbert, and this program is supported by 3FeetRadio.com. The French prisoners, beyond any shadow of a doubt, have really what boils down to just one lucky break after another, whether it's just dumb luck or it's somebody in a bad place finding a few fibers of humanity to lock onto, and Schrader moving on to uh, Josef Gangel. Mm-hmm. That is, uh, uh, now, Gangel is, to me, as a historian, he's the guy that I like the most. Uh, but um, uh, Jack Lee competes for my attention just as well, because in many respects, these two guys are night and day. Gangel is the career soldier. He lives and dies the job. It's uh, that That's everything that he has ever done. And and Lee is, you know, he's the he's the he's the athlete, and he's the college graduate, and this war is a temporary thing. And when he's done, he's going to go back to the states, and he's going to go back to that football jock thing. And you know, the, these two guys couldn't be hardly any different if you tried. And yet, dumb luck puts them together, and they manage to pull this thing off in spite of everything that's stacked against them. Mm. Um, it, it's interesting. They are they are night and day in a lot of ways. Uh, German American professional soldier, ROTC commission officer. But I, I think there's a part of the reason that they were able to come to a meeting of the mind so quickly is because in a lot of ways they were the same person. Jack Lee, yeah, you know, high school and college jock and everything else. But he, I also get the feeling that he found his niche as a tank. You know, he uh, when he went to Norwich University, the, the military school in Vermont. His favorite classes were equitation, you know, learning to to ride horses in the military way and cavalry maneuvers. Obviously, by the time World War II started, you know, cavalry was essentially a thing of the past, certainly in the American Army. So he became the next best thing. He became a tank officer. And the whole idea of zooming behind enemy line, these big scything thrusts across, you know, open open territory – it appealed to him, and and I also think he discovered that he had a knack for killing Germans. He he went through the Battle of 
Harrelsheim, and that was kind of a meat grinder, but you know, he brought his men through it as best he could. His men looked up to him as an officer, and, and like a lot of American officers in World War II, he came from essentially a civilian background and turned out to be uh, a damn fine soldier. When he meets Josef Sepp Gangl, you know, Gangl, is, as I mentioned earlier, had been in the, the German army since before the Nazis took over, and he worked his way up. Literally, he started out as a private. And by the time he met Jack Lee, he was a major. He had three decorations for heroism, earned for action both against the Russians and against the British. You know, right after the, the Normandy invasion, he was a, a rocket artilleryman, for lack of a better translation. And his units were responsible for bombarding the British units that were coming off the Normandy beaches, and he was very good at it. And then, you know, he and his unit sort of did this fighting retreat all the way across France and back into Germany. But like a lot of professional soldiers in the, in the German army at that time, Gangl was not a Nazi. He never, as far as we can tell, never joined the party, although his personnel records list him as a good party man and everything else. Apparently, he never joined the party. And, and if he did, I think I've always had the impression that he did it because that's what it was expected of him and of any other officer. From every account I've had of him, he was a fair, straight shooting kind of guy. He wasn't, you know, the, the sort of prototypical, you know, German jackbooted officer. And so when he and Jack Lee are thrown together, I think they recognized in each other the same professionalism, the same desire to protect their men. They recognized that same professionalism in each other and the same desire to bring their men out of this alive. And they were able to work together. I mean, they just sort of clicked, as people in, in different armies often do. Um, and uh, and I think that was very fortuitous because, you know, had Jack Lee only had, you know, Kurt Schrader to, to work with, that things might have turned out somewhat different. Very true. You alluded to the Alamo earlier, and especially as the combat heats up, when the castle is fully invested and under siege, it's really hard to miss that comparison. The imagery is not that much different because the times have changed and the weaponry has changed, but you describe in a single paragraph a scene that is almost like the Alamo, in which you've got uh, Gamelin and Barotra, De La Roque, Renaud, and I think it was Clemenceau, all on a parapet taking shots at the enemy, however inaccurately, but they're doing it, and that's, uh, uh, if nothing else, it, it can be taken as enthusiasm, it can, it can also be taken as, a, as a, a sign of just how desperate that defense is, and because you built the castle in as a character, I, I could not help but admiring the engineers who built the place, because if you could tell them that, oh, and by the way, your construction is going to stand up to weapons you haven't even heard of yet. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And, and you know, it, it's really true that when, when you see the castle today, and I was last there in September, you know, it may be medieval, but you're absolutely right in that, you know, the people who built this castle initially and then refined it over the over the centuries. They may not have known, you know, what howitzers and, and Panzerfausts and, and 88 millimeter guns were going to be like in the future. But the castle is very well sighted. It's connected to the, the main ridge by only this one small little bridge that has a gate at the end of it. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very defensible fortification now. I mean, it would still be hard to take if all you had was small arms. In fact, it would probably be virtually impossible to take that castle even today with modern small arms. You add in artillery and that gets a little more complicated. And certainly if, if you're using air power, that's, you know, castles are uh, or any sort of fixed fortification are pretty useless if, if somebody has air power. But the defense of the castle, and, and bear in mind, this was the, um, as far as I've been able to determine, this is the only time in American military history when U.S. troops have defended a medieval castle in combat. The defense was built around the same things that medieval defenders would have used, the thickness of the walls, the height of the walls, the, um, the ability to, to cut the castle off. And if you remember in the book, the, the Germans who are assaulting the castle have to come up these very, very steep hillsides. And I can tell you, having looked down those hillsides, you wouldn't want to try and run up them even 
without carrying a weapon and wearing a helmet and everything else. And the fields of fire, whether you're using bows and arrows and, and other medieval weapons or modern small arms, the fields of fire are excellent all the way around that castle. It's, it's, it's an amazing piece of work. Um, and that's kind of why I wanted people to understand what the castle itself was and, and why it was such a defensible position. And even so, they did it with a relatively small number of warm bodies. And at this point, uh, as we talk, one of the things that I like to do is, uh, is, is mention something relatively obscure just uh, from from the reading, just to demonstrate that I read the book, and the the the, the one thing that that struck me uh, as as being almost funny is during the during the reconnaissance of the castle, with the the various people going to and from, and the various SS units in the area, before they converge on the castle, you can almost see this from the SS point of view. It's like, what in the world are they doing over there? All that road traffic, there must be. Let's go look. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. There was a lot of uh, coming and going. Um, and the thing that amazed me, uh, you know, I, I've spent time in, in various conflict zones. And uh, I remember in particular driving into Iraq in a non-up-armored Humvee and just being scared senseless the whole time. So here you have these various parties of GIs. Obviously, they have a tank with them at one point. Lee's, Lee's group does. But everybody else is in Jeeps or other kinds of soft-skinned vehicles. There are you know, hostile enemy units absolutely for certain running around in the woods nearby. There are ambushes that they, they run into. It's a very, very uncertain situation. And here are all of these young soldiers, uh, literally on both sides probably, and I'm sure that the SS troops felt much the same way or might have. Nobody wants to be the last person killed in World War II in Europe. And yet, you know, Jack Lee is like, we're going to get to this castle and we're going to save these people and we're going to do whatever it takes to get there. And uh, so that to me is, is the sort of the amazing part of this. And then, you know, the SS units, you know, that were that were soon to besiege the castle, they're probably thinking, well, this is going to be a, a walkover. They've got one tank, not too many people, because remember, one of the, um, the the castle's garrison escapes and apparently tells the SS who and what is inside and how much ammunition they have and all those other good things. So it must have come as quite a shock to the SS people that they couldn't actually just kind of cakewalk in the front gate. And then, of course, you, you know, the, the other relief units that were trying to reach the castle, uh, one led by John Kramer's, you know, they were hot footed across, again, very uncertain territory. I mean, uh, these, these people had fortitude. Now, speaking of fortitude, if you were writing this as a Hollywood movie script rather than a doing the actual real world historical research, uh, the death of Joseph Gangel could not be more literarily perfect. Mm. I, exactly. I mean, it's um, it, it's almost a, you know the the height of a, a, a poem of, of great sacrifice that you might have read you know a hundred years ago. Gongle comes out of this as, as just an amazing person. And when you go to the small town of Virgil, right near Castle Leader, he's buried in the in the city cemetery. He's the only World War II person buried there. All the others are from World War One. And his grave is something of of a shrine. Uh, there are streets named after him in the city of Virgil. He's the Austrian government has a, an institute to study the anti-Nazi resistance, and he's well known there because of you know his contribution to, to Austrian freedom. I mean, not only did he help you know defend Itter Castle before that ever happened, when he is saying, became the de facto commander of all of the German forces in and around the town of Virgil, he basically said, "We're throwing our, in our lot with the anti-Nazi." Austrian resistance. He gave them weapons. He gave them support. He kept them from being attacked by roving SS bands. This is a man who, for for reasons we I hope we explain in the book uh, fairly well, decided that he wanted to be on the right side of history. And uh, and as as a result, he would have been you know a hero in any sense. But 
you know, to die in the process. I mean, this was a man who had survived some of the most hellacious battles of World War II, uh, essentially unscathed, as far as we could tell. And then, you know, he gives up his life, you know, literally at the last moment in defense of Austria, essentially, and, and of, to a certain extent of France. And it's an amazing story. And in the screenplay, I think Bryce Zabel, uh, with, with my input, I think has, has really captured not only Gangle, but the whole spirit of the story. It's not an accident that this is the politics and patriotism show because the very essence of history is a blending of politics and patriotism. The events described in Stephen Harding's latest book, The Last Battle, underscore this point, I think, quite thoroughly. The French politicians who holed up inside Castle Itter on May 4 or 5 of 1945 were perhaps a little too ungrateful for their own good. It says good things about the civic virtue of men like Captain Jack Lee and Major Joseph Gangle that they were able to put their differences aside and, as professional soldiers, come together in a time of crisis to do what was clearly the right thing. And I'll grant you that historiography as an art form is imperfect. And we have no way of knowing what really, truly was in the heart of Sebastian Wimmer. And we're actually never going to know what was going through the mind of Kurt Schrader. We're also not ever going to be able to fathom the motives of a long list of other people who are named in Harding's chronology. The very best, I think, that any historian can do from now on is to take what we now know about these events at Castle Itter with a grain of salt. The outcome was, in principle, good, even if the motives of certain people involved were, in principle, perhaps a tad shady. The fact is that there are different good, positive, ethical lessons to be learned from this for different good, positive, ethical reasons. For my part, I live in a country that is defended by citizen soldiers, and it pleases me greatly from a civic point of view to know that men like Captain Jack Lee and those who followed him, being the good citizens that they were, they stepped into the breach during that terrible moment when it mattered most. They could have dragged their feet, they could have found a reason to slow down, they could have found a reason to not do this. Given the prejudices of the day, I'm not sure anybody would have blamed them if they had accidentally shown up too late. Thankfully, he and his fellow citizen soldiers did not. And as much as I appreciate the blend of politics and patriotism that played its part in the outcome of this event, if I'm really honest with myself, I like the moral outcome here. I like the idea that, in this instance, the professional lifetime career soldier was able to stand shoulder to shoulder with the temporary citizen soldier. And I do appreciate the fact that few stood against many for the sake of principle. Ladies and gentlemen, this does bring us to a very fast and full hour-long episode, so if you like what you heard here today, please feel free to find us online at politicsandpatriotism.com. Click on the RSS feed button at the top of the page, and you'll be able to download all of our past episodes for free to your favorite MP3 player. Or go to the iTunes store, and with a few quick clicks, you can download all of our past episodes for free. And for all of you technology types on the go, if you'd like to stop by Stitcher.com, thanks to the very nice people at the Stitcher Smart Radio Network who distribute this program, you can download any of their free apps that will allow you to listen to us on your Apple smartphone, your Android device, or your tablet, wherever you might happen to be on this green earth. On behalf of everyone here at the show, thank you for your time and have a good day.